Welcome to Sardar TV, I'm Vaishali Jain. We're excited to have Jeff Rosenblum join us today. Jeff is an innovator in the field of digital marketing. He's co-founder of an advertising firm called Questus, and he's the author of a new book called Friction, Passion Branding in the Age of Disruption, and he's here to tell us more. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So tell us about your background and why you decided to write this book. Yeah, great question. So I guess if I take it all the way back, let me go all the way, all the way, all the way back, right? I was actually, I don't claim to be a great advertising person, right? But I will say that I was pretty much bred for it. My mom was a psychotherapist. My father was a salesman and my grandfather was a rum runner. So if you really analyze it, I was bred to work in advertising. And in particular, my focus is very much on research and understanding what consumers want. So that background growing up and listening to my mom almost every single evening talking about psychology was a great foundation. And I was a terrible student, graduated college, begged my way into a job in a market research company. And what happened then is I was conducting research and getting a bunch of data through very traditional mechanisms, things like mail surveys and telephone interviews and going to malls. And right around then, the internet was coming around and my boss said, hey, you know, why don't we try to figure out how to connect to the internet? You're, you're young, you figure it out, which I barely could. But what I did realize is if I could figure it out, and this is the future and everybody's going to be connected to the internet, our entire industry is going to port over and we're going to stop collecting data through traditional means and we're going to collect it through the internet. Lo and behold, that notion turned out to be correct. I turned out to be one of the first people, not the only, but one of the first and youngest people to figure out, holy smokes, internet research. So fast forward, went from barely graduating college, still a zit face kid, and I've got Microsoft, Netscape, Sun Microsystems, Walt Disney, Levi Strauss, Discovery Channel, all as my clients because we were on the leading edge of all this. And what they were doing was asking me not just to collect data about through the internet, but to help them figure out like what to do with the internet. And it was a great thrill to have all these amazing clients, but a couple years later I woke up and realized, wow man, this is, this is pretty boring, right? I'm, I'm collecting data, I'm making PowerPoint reports. At the end of the day, nobody wants PowerPoint reports. And I was like, I gotta, I gotta get out of here. I gotta, I gotta step off the grid, figure out my life. And I actually went to the Grand Canyon. Hiked down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, which takes about, about eight hours. I'm in the midst of this totally psychedelic experience in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And I had this very non-psychedelic thought, which was, why don't I start an advertising agency? Why don't I start a digital agency? Got totally inspired, ran out, called my best friend, who's this incredible artist. He had like art gallery openings, famous people like Johnny Depp were buying his paintings. He was doing some leading edge digital stuff. And I was like, hey man, do you wanna go start an advertising agency? He's like, dude, have you ever been in one? And I was like, no, have you? And he's like, no. Mm -hmm. Great, let's do it, man, <laughs> we're totally qualified. So we started this digital agency and we started with this one premise, which is if we take his really cool stuff and my really boring stuff, and we blend it together, we might have something. And fast forward 10 years later, we won Agency of the Year. And then the next year, we won Agency of the Year again. And then what happened is what always happens. I started to get bored, and I realized that there is this sort of revolution taking place, right? The way that people communicate with each other was fundamentally changing, but advertising was still kind of caught in the Mad Men era. So we wanted to create a little video, kind of like this one, for it. But the video grew and it grew and it grew, and next thing you know, we had a full-length documentary called The Naked Brand, and it was all about the advertising revolution. And then a couple of years later, starting maybe a year or two ago, we decided to really follow it up, and Jordan was like, let's do part two, and I was like, Godfather 2 was awesome. Every other sequel sucked, right? Why don't we do something else? Let's create a book. Let's get immersive. Let's give some guidance. So that's why we created Friction, which was to give tangible guidance for how companies can build passion brands in this age of disruption. So tell us more about what you are doing today and what some of your plans are for the future. Yeah. Well, right now, um, our agency, Questus, is really focused in on building these passion brands and doing it by embracing disruption. And when we see, say disruption, it's not just about leveraging technology or new tools like social media, right? It's about the strategies that are deployed. And really what's happened is we've taken this old mechanism of interruptions 
and we've ported it over to new media. So TV ads became pre-rolls and print ads became banner ads and junk mail became spam. So what we're focused in on is saying people want more than just interruptions, right? They want more than clever advertisement. And to be clear, we do tons of advertising and advertising can still do incredible things for brands, but we're asking advertising to do too much. People want content, they want tools, they want experiences that remove friction from their lives. They want tools that empower them and improve their lives one small step at a time. So that's what we're focused in on is how do we build passion brands by empowering people. Tell us about some of the reasons that you feel have led you to your success. First of all, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm successful. Like, I think the book is pretty good. I think the documentary is pretty good. I think the agency is really great, and I could take no credit for that. Like, we just have a great team. Um, I don't know, reasons for success? What do I have? First of all, incredible family, right? Absolutely incredible family. I don't know if this is like, I can give actionable advice on this, like actionable advice, marry the right spouse, right? I got really lucky. Married an amazing woman, she's helping raise two amazing kids. Point one. Point two, uh, amazing team. Absolutely amazing team. A lot of that was actually luck, to be honest with you. It's only in recent years in research through the book uh, that I've learned that there's amazing techniques and tools that can be applied to build a team of A players. And A players are the number one ingredient. It may be the only relevant ingredient to building a great team. Right now, I have an incredible team, and, and part of it was luck, or part of it was really, uh, you create a magnet, right? You get a few great people, and it attracts more great people. Going forward, I would love to apply some of these lessons I've learned. I don't know, the third one is probably uh, embracing uh, the true patterns of the way my brain works, which is, I don't know if I have ADD or ADHD. I don't have the attention span to go to a doctor and get diagnosed, nor do I care. I just know that my brain is pretty spastic. And as I've gotten older, I've learned to embrace it. Like all these crazy thoughts that go through your brain, you know, attach to those things, think about those things, embrace those things, you know, get a, a traditional non-digital alarm clock. That's one of the things I've done. And I said it when I wanted, wanted to write the book and I was embracing all these things going on in my brain. I had all these disparate thoughts and it's like, at some point, dude, you gotta calm down. You gotta get it on paper and you gotta organize this thing. And I realized the only way I could do it, set the alarm for 4.30 in the morning in a traditional alarm clock. Because if I used my cellular thing, my smartphone, and it went off at 4.30, the first thing I would do is check my email and it would change my brain waves. I'd get into stress and fight or flight. So really it was about getting up early, which is all tied together. You can't get up early unless you've got a great family that's gonna put up with that, unless you've got a great team that's gonna cover the stuff that you're missing. Now let's get into your book a little mm -hmm. and start off by telling us about the evolution of advertising. One of the things that we talk about is that advertising has gone through this complete and total revolution. And you know, if a revolution has a signal event, like the Boston Tea Party, our Boston Tea Party was search, right? We never even think much about search. It feels sort of dated or antiquated. We just, we use it, we don't think about it. But like, search was that pivot point where all of the power went away from creative brands to inquiring customers, right? No longer could we say, hey, this is new, this is improved, this is the best, and if it wasn't, get away with it, right? People could just quickly go up on Google and instantaneously get the information that they're looking for. It wasn't even Google. I mean, there was a bunch of search engines that came out before them. Google was just the first guys that can make that data easily accessible in a nice, clean interface, which, by the way, is a massive lesson that I, I can't believe that other companies are just waking up to right now. But you know, now you think about what's going on, it's every something like six and a half minutes, 150 times a day. For folks like you and me who are kind of in this industry, we probably look at our mobile device every four and a half minutes that we're awake, right? And brands are just pouring their interruptions into that and they're surrounding it everywhere. I was at a bar the other day, a bar, and they've got the little napkin and stir holder, square, and on the side of it is a screen. Like screens are so cheap, they put a screen and it's just running nonstop ads. Like you can't even grab a beer and get away with it, right? We see 5,000 branded messages per day. That's more than double the previous generation, which saw 2,000. So the point is this, is, you know, 
advertising is kind of caught in the madman era, right? Smiling pitch person gets on the screen, holds up the product, buy some, it's good. We might be more clever, we might have cooler music, we might have better cutaways, but the strategies are still largely the same. And, you know, I think the big lesson is that there's a better way to do it. And that's what fighting friction is all about. It's saying, hey, you can still use those interruptions, they still do great things, but you need something more in depth, more immersive, more engaging, and more empowering. Tell us about the concept of friction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, friction is anything that gets in the way of what you want to accomplish in life. It's anything that gets in the way of your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations, and even those mundane day-to-day -day goals, right? It's those big things that prevent you from being who you want to be. And it's those little things that prevent you from doing what you want to do, right? People are looking for more from brands. They want more than just clever advertisements. They want more to be than being marketed to. What they want are brands to solve their problems. And that's what fighting friction is about. It's about removing the barriers from people's lives. And when they do that, brands don't just get customers, right? They build an army of evangelists. And these evangelists can carry that brand message forward better than any paid advertising technique ever could. And ultimately, it has a profound impact on the bottom line. Brands that fight friction become passion brands. Passion brands absolutely dominate the competition. So define what a passion brand is then. Yeah, passion brands are brands that have more than customers. They have evangelists. They have people that go out of their way at the bar, at the restaurant, at the dinner table, around the campfire, and they actively proselytize for these brands. They, they treat these brands like they're friends, right? More than friends. They, they buy t-shirts for $29. They buy hats for $29 and become walking billboards. Sometimes passion brands have customers that have literally get tattoos on their arms, right? That's how much they're loved. Passion brands charge exorbitant prices, yet they have unwavering loyalty. And brands, you know, they're, they're just like human beings, right? People want from brands what they want from their friends, right? They want more than just entertainment. Your friends help improve your life in an authentic and important way, right? Your true friends. And that's what people want from brands. And when brands move people's lives forward one small step at a time, they slowly but surely become passion brands. There is one brand that you talk about in your book, Patagonia, mm. uh, the gear and outdoor clothing company. And they have a very interesting history of how they got started, but they have been able to very successfully build their messaging and their brand. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that and how they did that. I think the best way to talk about Patagonia is just from my own personal experience, right? So they created this platform called the Footprint Chronicles. And the Footprint Chronicles was all about fighting friction. So Patagonia is in the outdoor gear in apparel category. What's the friction that resides in that category? Well, to enjoy those products, you need a healthy outdoors. What's more is the creation of those products actually damages the outdoors because when we buy new products, we create garbage. When they develop new products, they have manufacturing byproducts, right? So they created something called the Footprint Chronicles, which which fights friction by empowering people through education. And what they did is they created an immersive website and you could pick any product. Let's say those board shorts that you love. You go swimming and you come out of the water in 45 seconds, they're dry. Well, guess what? Mother Nature did not create that product. When they create that product, they have to manufacture it. So you can actually follow the supply chain all around the globe and see how and where these products are created. And what they didn't try to do was paint a rosy picture. They weren't like, look how great we are at every stop. They said, here's the good, here's the bad, and here's what we want to do about it. They literally outed themselves for their negative impact on the environment, which is crazy. I've never heard of a brand in any way investing aggressively in outing themselves for what could be described as bad behavior, right? But what happened with that is they fought friction by educating people. And a lot of people probably saw these experiences and purchased less. But what they gain out of that is unwavering loyalty and evangelism. So what happened with me is I really fell in love with this initiative. 
and I met their CEO and a bunch of team members as we filmed the documentary. And it was Black Friday. It's the number one shopping day of the year. Brands sell more on Black Friday than they do in months combined. And because I love the brand, I wanted to get this jacket. In my mind's eye, I had this blue fleece jacket. Really wanted it. Type in Patagonia.com, bring up the website, on the homepage, boom, like, like they read my mind. The jacket is right there. Awesome. Then next to it, in a giant font, don't buy this jacket. And then a button, learn more. Holy smokes, what's going on here? Click on it. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Number one is reduce. Their basic point is this. Hey man, you want to buy this jacket? We'll sell it to you. But if you buy it, you're going to create garbage with your old jacket and we're going to create byproducts with a new jacket. Maybe you don't need this jacket. Maybe you can buy a little bit less. As a matter of fact, they've got a documentary, full-blown documentary called Warnware, and it celebrates people who have kept their Patagonia gear for decades and decades and decades and actually don't buy anymore. So I'm Jewish. I felt guilty. I didn't buy the jacket, right? They lost my sale. They lost thousands of sales that day, I'm sure. But they gained my unwavering loyalty. More important than that, they gained my evangelism. So I'm telling all my friends. I'm up on my social channels, right? We're here doing this interview, and we're talking about how great Patagonia is. More important than my yuppie ass, right, is the people who are truly influential, right? These are the people who are leading camping, and fly fishing and hiking adventures all around the world. By definition, these guides are leaders. They are influential and they're covered head to toe in Patagonia because Patagonia defends what they care about the most in this world, which is the environment. Patagonia fights friction by empowering people through education. Through that, they've become a passion brand. Through that, they've built an army of evangelists. Yeah. But isn't that a risk to their business and their business model and their revenues? Or did it work out? Well, right now, I mean, they were recently on the cover of a magazine known as the coolest company on the planet. Um, you know, Yvonne, the CEO or former CEO, proudly says every time they make a decision that's right for the environment, it helps make them more money. You know, in a lot of ways, it's irrational. This is totally irrational behavior. Telling your customers to buy less, outing yourself for what could be described as bad behavior, that's nuts, right? But out of that irrational behavior, they get irrational results, right? These jackets are sometimes double and triple what it costs to get a perfectly good jacket from a company like Columbia. It's irrational for people to buy their hats for, I don't know, $29 and become walking billboards. It's irrational to sit around the campfire and tell everyone how much you love this brand. It's a corporation, right? It's not your friend. That's irrational behavior. But they get that irrational behavior because they have irrational behavior themselves. So to your point, is it a risk? Absolutely it's a risk. But right now, because of the pace of change, because of data and technology, the biggest risk is not taking a risk, right? This is what we're seeing right now with why CEO of Ford just turned over, right? Not willing to take risks. I spoke to, I was on a radio interview the other day and you could hear the host and how scared they were to take risks because all of Detroit is really worried, like let's not do anything crazy. You know what? If you're not willing to take a risk, somebody else is. A lot of people are. And one of those brands are going to disrupt your industry. So it's almost like cannibalism, right? That was the big thing back in the day. You got to be willing to cannibalize your own brand and your own product. Now it's you have to be willing to disrupt your own brand in your own product. Can you elaborate a little bit more on how search and mobile technology is disrupting the relationship that brands are having with their customers? Yeah, in a nutshell, search, social, mobile technology have made brands completely transparent. It doesn't matter what brands do or say, the truth is gonna come out. Every brand right now sits on an exponential curve. It's either exponential growth or exponential decline because people are gonna take that message and expose you virtually instantaneously, right? That United Airlines video. This is a really interesting exercise. Go up on Google, type in the United Airlines fiasco or whatever, and then click on images. What's amazing about all of those images is not just this horrible behavior that went on, that's, that's quite obvious, 
but how many cell phones are actually in the foreground, right? So it wasn't just one person who was like, oh my God, I'm gonna catch this thing. Everyone was like, whoa, pull it out. And everyone has a supercomputer. Everyone has unprecedented video technology right in their pocket. So they were able to expose United instantly. Hits Facebook, hits Twitter, hits major media, done. Now next thing you know, United is in a pickle. United can now spend hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars on ads. Every single dollar they spend they can be targeted right towards me and they can tell me, I really care about you. Really? I'm not gonna buy that, right? I'm not gonna believe that because I've seen your behavior. I've seen the truth. So I can see right through that advertising. Now the same is true when brands invert that model like Patagonia. When they do great things, when they improve people's lives, when they remove friction, People also take the message, whether it's a video or a review or a rating or a message on those social channels, and they will help brands become passion brands. They will put them on that exponential curve because people want to reward brands for improving their lives. Can you share some examples of how brands are fighting friction? There's lots of great examples, and what we tried to do in the book was come up with micro case studies. So it wasn't like here's 20 pages on one brand. We tried to do a page or two, a handful of paragraphs, and really give some breadth to it. And one of the ones that I love the most is Yeti. And the reason that Yeti is interesting is that they make coolers. Coolers have been around for, I don't know, like a hundred years. This is really mundane technology when you think about it, right? It keeps your beer cold keeps your soda cold, keeps your bologna sandwiches cold, doesn't do much else. Yeti is a full-blown lifestyle brand, a full-blown passion brand. Like, let's get to the finish line. The guys who invested in Yeti, it was in Wall Street Journal the other day, they invested $57 million in the company. It's now forecasted when it goes IPO to be worth $3.3 billion. There was another article in Wall Street Journal a few weeks ago that people are pulling up in Mercedes-Benz and literally stealing these coolers. I tried to do a partnership with them for one of my clients. We gave them a jingle and they're like, we don't even have the inventory, right? Can't keep up. These coolers sell for, I don't know, very often like $700 when you can get a perfectly good cooler for $150. Ad Age summarized it perfectly. They've got an article that says, you might not be able to afford a Yeti cooler, but you can afford a Yeti hat. And what that means is people are buying their t-shirts and buying their hats and walking around like walking billboards. Like I'm a fly fisherman, I'm terrible at it. But it's amazing to see how many Yetis are out on the river and how many people are wearing the Yeti hat, right? That's the results. So, how'd they get there? Two ways. Both of them are about fighting friction. The first is they fight friction through the product. The product is fundamentally better than any other product in the category. It's literally certified grizzly bear proof. There's an independent organization that figures out whether stuff is grizzly bear proof. I don't think the vast majority of these products are in any danger of getting attacked by a grizzly bear, but it's sure nice that if you're using a cooler, which means you're in the outdoors, you're probably looking for an adventure, it's really nice to know like this thing can handle anything you throw at it. That's a piece of friction. People want bigger adventures, and that's the thing about improving people's lives, right? This isn't just willy-nilly, hug the trees, save the manatees, green movement. It's about improving people's lives in a relevant way. So that's what Yeti does with the product. Now, what I really love is the way they do it with their marketing. The average digital advertising exposure is 1.6 seconds. They've created a series of videos, each of which are about eight minutes long. And they're amazing. They're absolutely addictive. They're absolutely beautiful. They are absolutely wonderful, right? So there's one that's all about the world's most dedicated fly fisherman. There's one that's all about the world's greatest ski guide. There's one that's all about the world's greatest barbecue pit master. And she happens to be like an 89-year-old woman, right? It's, these, these stories are amazing. What you don't see in these videos is anything about Yeti. You literally have to watch them a few times over and then you might see like, oh, that's a Yeti cooler in the background only because you're looking for it. Like one of my favorite ones is there's this death-defying uh, kayaking trip in Texas. And these people literally, they kayak all night, they're breaking bones, they're getting attacked by mosquitoes. It's a horrible looking experience. And the winner gets a patch. That's it. 
No money, no trophy, you just get a patch. And it's this amazing story about these people who are risking life and limb just for a patch. The only time that you see the Yeti brand at any point is at the end, there's one of the contestants is passed out cold in the grass with a Yeti hat over his head blocking the sun. That's it. So what happens is they make these videos and they live in their social channels and it lives on YouTube. But for the most part, I go up on Yeti.com to get these videos. So they get that brand association. I've now watched not eight minutes, I've probably watched about two hours of these videos. I've probably shared it with dozens and dozens and dozens of my friends who have then shared it with dozens and dozens and I've talked about it and I've wrote in the book and now I've become an evangelist for this brand. So that's what happens because that marketing, that's not just storytelling, that's fighting friction because inspiration is a way to fight friction. If you're in that category, you're looking for bigger and bolder adventures. And that's what those stories are about. It's about giving people a bigger and bolder vision of themselves. So what are some of the differences between the old, more traditional models of advertising versus some of the newer ones like you're talking about today? Yeah, this might be my shortest answer. Empowerment over interruptions. The new model is about empowering people. It's about improving people's lives one small step at a time. The old model is about interruptions. It's about finding them and interrupting them over and over and over again. The advertising industry keeps making advertisements and the audience keeps running away. We need a better tool and that tool is empowerment. So you also mentioned that old traditional advertising shouldn't completely go away either, yeah. right? So how can they both be used effectively? That's a great question. I need to be abundantly clear with this. Advertising can still do absolutely incredible things for brands. We're just asking advertising to do too much. This is really not about the death of advertising. That false eulogy has been written before. What it's saying is we got technology, and it's not even really advanced technology, right? These social channels, your website, in-depth articles, videos, ratings, reviews, user-generated content, that can tell the larger brand story. Like Yeti, people will go and spend eight minutes, 30 minutes, hours interacting with a brand. Brands are no longer limited to a 30-second TV spot, a 15-second pre-roll, a full-page print ad, a 300-pixel banner ad. They can tell an immersive story through in-depth content, or more importantly nowadays, following that entire consumer journey, using data to understand who are they, where are they in the purchase journey, what are their unmet needs, and how do you deliver the right content at the right time. And very often, that content is not advertising. Now, if you build immersive content and experiences and you don't have any awareness, it's like building a candy store in the desert. You need advertising to drive traffic in. So all those aforementioned advertising tools, they no longer have to tell the entire brand story. They just need to become a gateway to these immersive experiences. Now, here's the other thing that's really cool, to me at least, which is it all lives in a virtuous cycle, which means every time somebody interacts with one of these immersive experiences, they're looking for data and they're creating data, right? We know some easy stuff like their demographics, their age and their gender and all that. We know some psychographics, what makes them tick. But most importantly, we know about their purchase behavior, right? What's motivating them to purchase? What's the purchase barriers that they're looking for? What have they learned so far? What are they very likely to want to learn next? All of that data is being created. At the same time, we could feed it back into advertising to say, okay, now we can target people more accurately with demographics and psychographics. We can message more accurately with behavioral messaging and drive them back through. And now this virtual cycle, because every time somebody interacts with either an ad or that immersive content, they're giving data, they're looking for data, and everything can be improved over and over and over again. Now, there's two categories of friction that you lay out. That's micro and macro. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the differences, perhaps through an example, if you can. Yeah, friction is its a lot like economics. It can be broken up into the macro and the micro. And then there's a small subset of companies that are removing both macro and micro, and those are the passion brands. 
I think the most tangible example, and I'm not sure, honestly, if Uber is a passion brand, right? I think a lot of people would argue they've got some really bad value systems and they hate the brand. And then I could say, okay, well, let's just take it away from you and see how you feel. And I think most people would be pretty upset if they didn't have Uber anymore. But what I love about them is almost everybody's used them within the past week or two. Almost everybody who's used them has recommended to someone. It's a nice, tangible example. Macro friction sits at the category level. It's something that holds people back in the totality of an industry. So in transportation, the friction is that people were looking for alternative form of transportation. They didn't want to have to use their car every single time they wanted to get from point A to point B. They didn't want to sit out there aimlessly waving their arms, hoping for a taxi in the rain. They needed an alternative form. At the same time, you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of people with their cars looking to monetize them. And then they just took a really straightforward tool, the mobile app, and connected these two parties. That sits at the category level. They change the entire industry. Micro friction sits at the relationship level. So when you think about Uber, you never have to break out your wallet. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to enter in your credit card number. They've got technology, you take a picture of your credit card, it's in there forever, right? Now when it's time to leave, thank you very much, have a great day, don't have to fumble for your wallet, don't have to figure out the tip, it's all included. The five-star rating system, I never, ever would have saw this coming, but it keeps everybody so civilized, right? It's completely Darwinian, right? If you act like a jerk, you're gonna get low ratings, and you're gonna lose money. If you as a passenger act like a jerk and you get low ratings, you're less likely to get picked up, right? That little piece of micro friction has a fundamental difference in the experience. And then there's little things like, hey, you got Spotify? You wanna get your music playing on their stereo? Flip it on up there. Going home, one click away. Going to the office, one click away. Don't have to enter it all in. Compare it to taxis, right? Taxis literally make more money for embracing micro friction. The more they get lost, the more money they make. Uber, on the other hand, embraces micro friction in that relationship. They use the Waze or whatever technology to figure out what's the shortest ride. Everything about that micro friction fighting feeds into that macro friction platform to create a product that I personally do not want to live without. How do organizations go about building brands mm. that help them remove the micro and the macro friction? Yeah. So when we wrote the book, what we wanted to do was have some really fun stories. We wanted to have some really cerebral content like uh, neuroscience findings and whatnot. And we also wanted to provide actionable advice. We didn't want it to be just a series of platitudes. And one of the actionable pieces of advice we talk about is the brand hierarchy. The brand hierarchy is a lot like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? When Maslow was trying to figure out human nature, he created this hierarchy. Food, water, shelter sits at the bottom. Happiness, self-actualization sits at the top. His point is like, yeah, we all want to be happy and self-actualized, but you can't if you're starving to death. You need to focus on the bottom before you can move up. Brands also have a hierarchy. Unfortunately, for most brands, they've built their hierarchy upside down. If you move away from the conversations that they have and look at something very quantitative, which is how they spend their money, the vast majority of dollars go to paid advertising. This is where we're asking advertising to do too much. It can still do great things. It just needs to sit at the right place in that hierarchy. So what we've learned through tens of thousands of pieces of information and data and interviews and articles is it all starts with what we call frictionless leadership. That is at the base of the brand hierarchy. It's about getting everybody aligned on a common mission, common value system, and really importantly, building a communication cadence system to keep everybody aligned, right? Frictionless leadership is not about charisma. Studies show like extroverted and introverted leaders do equally well. It's about behaviors, values, communication, and also actually staffing, having an incredible process to create a staff that believes in and follows that behavior system. Then you move up to the next level. Can't skip that. If you skip it, you're in trouble. Then you move up into what we call frictionless categories. And by the way, this is critical to create a passion brand. But if you don't want to create a passion brand, which is absolutely fine, there's lots of good brands out there making good money with good careers. You can skip over this. But if you want to have a passion brand, 
you have to fight friction that resides in a category. So for example, Yeti fights friction in the cooler category by helping people have this bigger and bolder vision of themselves through inspirational creative. Patagonia fights friction in the category by helping people understand how they can defend the environment more effectively. You don't have to buy a Yeti cooler to watch those videos. You don't have to buy a Patagonia jacket to learn from those guys, but they're removing friction in the totality of the category. The next is you're moving into frictionless commerce. This is about micro friction. Here's the great irony. All of the technology that makes it easier for people to buy products makes it tougher for corporations to sell products. Because just when we figured out the desktop, mobile came along. Just when we figured out mobile, social came along. Just when we figured out social, well, social wearables came along. Now there's, I don't know if you have an Amazon Alexa or Google Home. These things are incredible. We come in, you, you talk to your home. There's no screen at all, right? So all of these little tools are heightening people's expectations. They're diminishing the empathy that they have for your brand, and they just want to purchase things really, really easily. That's tough, and seamlessly. Like, don't remember me on my desktop, but forget me on my mobile. Don't remember me on my mobile, but forget me on my wearable, right? It all needs to be connected. So now you've got leadership, category, commerce. Finally, we get to frictionless advertising. There's still billions, billions of dollars left over for what we call frictionless advertising. And frictionless advertising is about using those traditional tools, TV, print, digital, pre-rolls. All of this content and information can be disseminated through paid media. You can target exactly who you want. But without first focusing on the hierarchy, you're asking it to do too much. So now you're able to use that advertising as a gateway into an immersive experience. And again, it lives in that virtuous cycle where it's fueled by data, creates data, and is optimized by data. How important is passion branding for organizations that provide services, for example, that aren't as tangible, let's say a Cisco or an Oracle, an IBM? I think fighting friction is imperative for corporations selling products and corporations selling services. Now that I think about it, you know, it probably is even more important for corporations selling services. The reason is the more in-depth and more expensive a product or service is, the more fighting friction works. If you're selling a pack of gum, cheap beer, you could argue that entertainment is more important than actually empowering people through fighting friction. But the more time people spend making a purchase, and if you're going to purchase, like you mentioned the example of IBM, I mean, you're going to spend a lot of time doing that research. And probably not just you, your entire team, there's going to be tools and systems and content. Your whole career is on the line. Your ability to feed your children and get health insurance, everything is on the line. So darn right, you're going to go through a lot of research. You're going to go on an entire journey. And on that journey, you're not hoping for IBM printed, IBM integrated banner ad, IBM integrated pre-roll. You're looking for some content that helps answer this question. And that content is going to be immersive. And that content needs to empower you, enrich you, educate you. That's what fighting friction is all about. So just going back to the hierarchy mm -hmm. for a moment, uh, we talked about the, the different steps of removing friction. What happens if you remove one and not the other? I think if you skip steps in the brand hierarchy, it's fine. You have a good brand. I mean, I could argue that in, in my own organization, we don't have all the steps aligned. I, don't, I wouldn't say we're a passion brand. I mean, except for my mom and dad, I haven't seen anyone wearing a hat with my agency's name on it, right? There's no shame in being a good brand, right? There's no shame in skipping some of these steps. You can argue that, you know, there are certain companies, Apple is now one of them. They used to be a passion brand. They're not anymore. Your cable company is a classic example. United Airlines is a classic example. They make boatloads of money. The executives running those companies are, are infinitely more successful and intelligent than I'll ever be. There's no shame in these good companies. It's just not what our book is about. It's not what my passion is about, is about, right? My passion in the book is about creating passion brands. These are the brands, and there's very few of them, these subsets of brands that are fundamentally improving people's lives one small step at a time. They're not getting customers, they're getting emotionally engaged customers. They're building an army of evangelists. They're fundamentally 
outperforming the competition. That's what each of those steps are all about. But yeah, you can skip some and be a good brand. And there's a, hundreds of books on that topic also. We just wanted to do something else. Okay, let's talk about measurement a mm -hmm. little. You also point out how advertising might be being done in the wrong way because of the, the type of metrics that organizations might be using uh, and the way they might be using those metrics to perhaps assess their strategies and the success of their branding and messaging. Tell us more about that. Yeah, the, the expression we use in the book is that metrics made the industry go apeshit. Right? They, people have lost their minds over metrics. There's so much data available to us. It's obviously unprecedented. You know, Just in the past few minutes, there's been literally millions of data points that have been collected by virtually every major corporation. We're addicted to them, but we're missing the bigger picture. Right? If you look at what Patagonia did, if you look at what Yeti has done, if you look at Under Armour through the years, these great brands were built through leadership. They were built through conviction. They weren't built through all these little data points. Little data points can help you optimize, right? But it's not gonna help you become a passion brand. Your passion brand requires something bigger and bolder. And by the way, a lot of those metrics can be really misleading, right? Because what'll happen is, we call it last click, which means Someone will click on something like a search link. Someone will click on something like a banner ad. Someone will click on something like an email, right? This is why we're getting inundated with emails right now because people click on them and buy. So everyone's like, oh my God, that email's incredible. Oh my God, that search term is incredible. That banner ad's amazing. It's not that. There's this entire ecosystem that feeds into building a passion brand. Unfortunately, we don't have great attribution tools, that's what they're called, which connects it all and helps us figure out how important are each of these individual touch points. So metrics are being misleading because very often people are just looking, what's the last place people clicked, right? Give you an example. There's a clothing brand I buy from, right? Very frequently, I get like 80% of my, my, my clothing from this one company. I'm not particularly creative, it's fine, it's affordable, it looks pretty good, the whole nine yards. Somewhere along the line, I've gotten onto their email list. Makes sense. I actually have sorted by this company just to look and double check what's going on here. And this is what it looks like. 20% off, 25% off, 30% off. Today only, don't miss this sale. Back to 20% off, 25, it's If you look at the metrics of that email, it's their number one channel because people are like, dude, sale, click, I'm gonna buy on that whole thing. Not me, I'm scared out of my mind to buy from this company more. I, I used to buy all my clothing from them, now I can't because I'm scared. I go in the store, I'm missing the sale, right? Gosh, golly, if I go right up on their website, I'm gonna be missing the sale. It's cheapening them over and over and over again. Snapchat is doing it right now. They're running a discount in a promotion when they're selling their ad platform to these major corporations right now. So the metrics might look like, hey, yeah, we're selling more advertising at Snapchat. We're selling more clothing at this retail store but you're not, you're damaging the totality of your brand, right? You need a system that looks at all of those metrics together, but even that is only a tactical tool. At the end of the day, it comes down to great leadership, it comes down to content that has conviction. This is how many people are using advertising metrics to not analyze the data properly. How should they be using the metrics that they have, what types of metrics should they be using to actually analyze and see if you know their messaging, their branding is successful? Well, let's start at what we're looking to accomplish, right? Which is we're looking to improve perceptions of a brand. From an advertising perspective, we tie it back to the sales funnel, right? Awareness, interest, conversion. Now there's evangelism because people are so digitally connected. And when search and social and mobile technology came out, people started thinking that the sales funnel was completely disrupted. They changed the shape into a sousaphone, consultants started charging exorbitant rates, all this stuff. It's still shaped like a funnel because lots of people are aware, less people are interested, less people buy, and less people become evangelists. All of the stuff that we focus in on, all of the great and passion brands out there, it's all about the mid funnel, which is perceptions of a brand. The brands that you love, the brands that we all love, they're not built because they're doing great stuff at the top, like great awareness, I know their name, and it's not done at the bottom. Great sales, great promotions, like they, they talk me into buying, no. It's the mid funnel. You perceive them to be great because 
they have a value system that you love, they have some shared empathy, they improve your life in some way, shape, or form. That pushes you down the sales funnel, not just to be a customer, but to be an evangelist. So the key is to build a metric system around that so you're able to track the perceptions of your brand. If you can track it back to an activation, like a piece of content, that's great. All of this stuff is really easy to skew, right? I spent 10 years purely doing research. I've spent about 25 years loosely doing research. There's so much data, so much metrics. It's easy to skew and twist this stuff to tell any story that you want to. So it's important that you come up with something that seems logical and sound for the mid funnel. It's important that when at the end of the day, you really are focused in on sales. Don't get me wrong, like you have to sell stuff, but you need to be able to tie it all together through attribution tools. So you're not just looking at that last click. How does perceptions in those videos or user generated content or experiences, how does it tie together with stuff that might, people might click on like an email? So there's all these different things. At the end of the day, with all of this data and all of this technology, it still comes down to great intelligence, great creativity, and great leadership. If it was as simple as boop, boop, get the data, every brand would be a passion brand. That's antithetical, that's impossible, right? You need great leadership. You need people to say, yeah, I'm gonna use the metrics as a piece of input, but that is not the absolute tool to fix everything. Like, you can easily get confused by the data. You have to be looking at the bigger picture. You have to be looking at the stories that are told through the data and those broad insights. Now, you've said that success behind building a great brand is building a great team. Mm -hmm. right? So tell us a little bit about the hiring process and how that's important and how that should be done when it comes to branding and messaging. Okay. I love this question. I'm really passionate about this question because I'm not an expert in this question in any way, shape, or form. Let me get to the answer here. Go buy this book called Who. It's written by a guy named Jeff Smart. I, Jeff is not a personal friend of mine. This is not like, hey, buddy, I'm hooking you up. Like, I've met him. We, we've talked a bunch. He's got a whole consulting firm that, that talks about this. The book is amazing. So at the end of the day, his whole point is this. It's, it's about getting A players. And his point is that A players are defined as those who have a 90% chance of doing what only 10% of people can do. And I've learned this the hard way. If you don't hire an A player, if you hire someone who is substandard, that employee will cost you 15 times his or her base salary on average. Hire someone for $100,000, doesn't work out, it's gonna cost you $1.5 million dollars. Now clearly this changes, right? You hire a CEO or a president or something. There's, there's a big skew in here, but on average, I have found this back of the napkin to be pretty darn true. The other interesting thing is that 50%, 50% of hires are failures. It's crazy. If 50% are failures and they're that expensive, you better darn well buy into a process. I am not uh, sufficiently advanced on this topic to describe the process, but what I love about his book is it's not like, here's cool storytelling, I'm gonna make you laugh. It's like, this is, it's engaging, but it's step-by-step -step directions. And I am totally convinced that if I read this book right when I graduated college, we would be doing the same interview, but it would be on a beach, on my private island, because that's how powerful this book is. I'm really a believer in it. Tell us how you personally hire people for your agency, for example. Do you use some of the methods that he's outlined? You know, increasingly we're trying to use methods from who. He has this early chapter in the book where he talks about different types of uh, interviewers. And what's great about it is he puts it into these like maybe nine different categories. And by reading that earlier, you're like, oh wow, I am that type of person. And I can't remember what my category is, but. I've always been like, hey, if you can make me laugh in the interview, <laughs> like, pretty good. Like, that, that works, right? I remember hiring this woman. She worked at uh, the Cheesecake Factory. I worked in restaurants my whole life. I, I thought I was going to be a cook. I thought I was going to be a restaurateur. I went into the agency business. It's very similar, right? You're trying to do something cool and creative, but it has to be commercially viable and all that. So I love people who come from the restaurant industry. And this woman comes in, and she's interviewing, and she was a waitress at the Cheesecake Factory. And one of the stories she told is about how 
when the customers would get pissed off at her, they would literally take the cheesecake and throw it at her. And I'm like, wow, that's a great experience. Because if you can handle a customer throwing cheesecake at you, you can pretty much handle anything in the client relationship. You're hired. She shows up. It's about four days into it. I'm like, I didn't stop to think, why are they throwing cheesecake at her? <laughs> like, like, I was so off the mark. And what I've learned is I'm not really great at this, right? I think I'm good at a part of it. I think I'm good at figuring out the cultural fit. But the truth of the matter is there's a lot that goes into it. And the book in our process is about bringing in a team and trying to find holes in that equation and then pick it apart. And that's where I would get misguided, right? I would, I would miss those holes and move forward. So you really need this team approach. How can organizations be sure that they're cued in onto the friction signals that are being given off in, in the industry? One of the most important things that we've learned is that silos kill, right? The best organizations break down silos internally. And I think a lot of the younger organizations right now that are becoming passion brands, the Airbnbs of this world, they've got a competitive advantage. They're still huge companies, but they're being built without the hamstringing of legacy business models, right? Which really have these siloed organizations. Finance doesn't talk to operations. Operations doesn't talk to marketing. Marketing doesn't talk to product development. Product development doesn't talk to social listening. Social listening doesn't talk to traditional research. And sometimes they do and they try, but it's really hard. All of these signals are absolutely imperative. So that comes down to that frictionless leadership which is how do you break down those silos? How do you have a communication cadence? How do you make sure that you're nimble? This is going to be the number one determinant about whether brands thrive, whether brands survive, whether brands become good, whether brands become passion brands. That's it, silos kill. So given everything that we've just talked about, everything that organizations are facing, brands are facing, why is it that not every brand, not every organization is fighting friction. Oh, every brand's not fighting friction because there's the machine and these, these shiny objects, right? So uh, I guess an anecdote will bring it to life best. We were working with one of the world's biggest food companies. And this was maybe half a dozen years ago and they brought us in, they wanted us to help them launch a new product. So they said, what do you think? You know, what's your big idea? I'm like, blah, 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 you know, gave the whole pitch. We thought we we're all smart and everything. And, and the woman we're, we were speaking with, she, she just started laughing, literally laughing at us. I was like, wow, this is interesting. But, you know, I was kind of into it. I was like, she knows what she's talking about. If she's going to laugh at our ideas, she must really know. And she's like, here's the way this thing is going to go down. And she's like, we're going to spend X dollars here, X dollars there, X dollars there. That's fine. Classic media planning. And she's like, and here's how we're going to make the 30 second spot. We're going to spend nine seconds with the woman who gets in, onto the camera, walks into the living room. Three seconds, she's going to hold up the product. Six seconds, she's going to smile with a friend on the couch. And she had broken it down, not just mathematically about dollars, but mathematically creative. He was right. He was absolutely right. Like they had worked on this model for decades and decades and decades. Except for one thing. The way that people interact with that ad has been completely disrupted. People are no longer sitting on the couch like, hmm, let me look at this ad. This is great, right? That worked back in the day. But when things got disrupted by search and social and mobile technology, people started avoiding ads. There was an ethnographic research study that was conducted recently. And what they want to know is, how are people interacting with TV ads? What they assumed they were going to find is that people are fast forwarding on their DVR over TV ads. That's not what they found. People just take their mobile device, look down, mess around on Instagram, poke around on Facebook, do a couple things on Snapchat. Three minutes later, look back up. Hey, there's my TV show. Hey, there's my sports game. So it actually looks like, here's your misguiding data, it actually looks like the ad is being seen. They didn't even click the channel or fast forward over it. But emotionally, they're missing the ad. So in that example, she works at this multi-billion dollar organization with an infinite number of case studies and data points. And they've optimized this entire system, which worked perfectly well until a few years ago when everything was completely disrupted. 
Now, it's not just the machine, which, by the way, it's not just organizations. There's an entire ecosystem, right? You do pretty well in high school. You go to Harvard. You go to Harvard Business School. You go to one of these huge organizations. You do some cool creative. There's a town in France, Cannes, which is completely dedicated to the advertising industry. Like, there's this giant machine. And then there's the shiny objects. Snapchat. Facebook a few years ago, Instagram, who knows? I mean, by the time we get out of this room, there's probably three more platforms out there. And each of these seem really interesting because the audience is flocking to them. Like, yeah, man, I love Snapchat. Kids love Snapchat. They're gone, I'm done, I'm done with Facebook, I'm going over to Snapchat. So brands are like, well, if that's where the audience is, we need to be there. It's natural, right? Soap operas are called soap operas because the audience was there and ivory soap came along, right? The issue is that people don't necessarily want brands there. And at the very least, they don't want brands there in the same old way. They don't want to be interrupted. They don't want friction to be created. They need a new strategy. They need brands to fight friction. So the machine still works. Traditional advertising still works. The shiny objects still work. Social media works. But you need a new strategy. You need to empower people, not just interrupt them. So we talked a lot about metrics and measurement and data. In your book, you also talk about the presentation of data mm -hmm. and how that is just as important to fighting friction. Oh, yeah. Tell us more. Well, I got a lot on this one. I'm really passionate about it. Uh, let me talk about a massive failure that I was part of. That might be the best way to answer it. So I'll even tell you the company in this one because uh, they were right and we were all wrong. It was Discovery Channel. Discovery Channel is a great brand for advertising agencies to have as a client. Not because they're so huge and you make a ton of money, like this isn't AT&T, this isn't Verizon, but they're incredibly creative. So the team loves getting their hands on these ingredients where they could do cool creative stuff. So we're all amped up, we're all excited, we fly out there, we do the typical thing. I think we've got like, I don't know, five of us around the table and then there's like eight executives from Discovery Channel around the table. And we, and I'm sitting in the back, and we start the presentation, and there's just data, just tons of data on the screen. I don't know what the font size was, but let's say it's like size 14, right? And there's like eight bullet points, and then the next one's like a table with like size 10 font, and there's like 100 cells, and they're like, on to another one. We're like, look how smart we are, man. We are smart. We get strategy. We get data. Look at this information, the whole nine yards. <laughs> and I hear this executive lean over and he goes, this is the genius presentation. And he didn't call it the genius presentation because we were geniuses. He called it the genius presentation because we were trying to show that we were geniuses and we were a bunch of schmucks. We bored the hell out of them. And let me tell you something. When the creative came around at the end of this presentation, in my humble opinion, I didn't do it. It was great. It was great creative. But we had so emotionally disengaged the audience that we could show them the Taj Mahal and they would not be interested in it. We had just completely blown the emotional state of the audience. And I've seen this over and over and over again. Now, I have to admit, I'm a little bummed out because this knowledge is extraordinarily powerful and we're starting to see a trend. There was an article yesterday about how Google now presents internally, like our competitive advantage is dwindling because people are waking up to the fact like, you need to emotionally engage people. You need to take out all that data and information in small fonts. And you now, it's really this simple. When you come up with an idea, whoever you think your competition is, that's not your competition. Your competition is the smartphone. You need to keep people from looking down at their smartphone. It's not about how cool and creative you have, how much cool and creative content you have in your presentation. It's about removing all the boring stuff. One boring slide, one slide with a bunch of data, font too small, lengthy sentences, people go, they look down. Now they're done. That executive, that chief marketing officer, your boss, whoever it may be that you've spent months trying to get in front of, they're gone because now their fight or flight system has kicked into gear. They're thinking about something else. The server's on fire. The contract hasn't been signed. Whatever it be, might be, they're disengaged. So the whole key is you need to engage that audience. And it seems obvious. Like I was telling this whole thing to someone recently and they're like, so just remove the boring part? I'm like, yeah, I think that's it. Just remove the boring parts. But I don't know why, but we're addicted to the boring parts. Now, in your book, you've laid out something called the Opportunity Index, mm. which helps you 
basically lay out what your resources are and invest them effectively. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, in the book, what we'd like to do was open everything with an anecdote rather than getting right into the metrics. And very often, they're anecdotes not about brands, but about people who have laid down a strategic foundation outside of the world of marketing. And the one for this one was Bill Walsh. Bill Walsh was the coach of the San Francisco 49ers. He walked into the San Francisco 49ers headquarters in 1979, and he had this sort of neatly combed hair, these pressed khakis, this red sweater. He did not look like a football coach. He looked like a professor, right? He just needed a bent billiard pipe to round out his entire look. He didn't yell. He didn't scream. He didn't give rah-rah speeches. Back then, you got to realize, like, football was played with one simple approach. Big, strong men blocking against big, strong men with one big, strong running back, right? The Super Bowl trophy is called the Lombardi Trophy because he created that strategic underpinning. Bill had this one idea. Why don't we put the ball where the other team isn't? So he set it up to look just like every other team. Bunch of big, strong guys blocking against other big, strong guys. Running back comes in, goes to get the ball, but at the last minute, the quarterback took the ball out. And then he threw it into what's called the flats. It's an area of the field that nobody was using. The, yard, the field is 53 yards wide. He talks about this over and over again, which was nobody had played with this. They all thought about the 100 yards of depth, not the 53 yards of width. And he would throw the ball about six yards off the line of scrimmage. A guy named Jerry Rice would catch the ball. And then 70% of his yards he would get just by running with the ball because nobody was there. And people are like, oh, you had Jerry Rice, you know, he was the greatest receiver, you had Joe Montana, he was the greatest quarterback. No, he started this stuff, which is called the West Coast offense. He started this stuff in a very non-West Coast town of Cincinnati, where he had a terrible quarterback. He literally had a, a weak-armed quarterback, which is what it was. He couldn't throw it down the field. He had to throw it to the flats, and he had a bunch of other mediocre players, and he went from terrible all the way to the playoffs. When he finally got a decent players, he won the Super Bowl, he won the Super Bowl again, they won like five Super Bowls, he's in the Hall of Fame, he changed football forever. The reason this anecdote is important and a long way of answering your question is this is what brands need to do. They need to put the ball where the other team isn't. Brands are not going to win a contest. Maybe if you're Coke and Pepsi, maybe if you're Budweiser, maybe if you're AT&T, you can get by on might, right, which is just huge budgets and you know maybe a great agency. Other brands need to figure out something else. You're just not going to win that contest. So putting the ball where the other team isn't is about finding an opportunity that's unmet, providing value to consumers, something that people really want, so they'll engage with it, they'll share it with others, they'll become not just customers, but evangelists. So what we realized is you need a mathematical model, right? There's too many touch points. There's dozens of touch points. I mean, Facebook isn't just Facebook. There's all different ways of activating in Facebook. And then you got Snapchat, and you got Twitter, and you got your website, you got videos, you got user-generated content. It goes on and on and on. When we conduct research, we find that for many of our brands, they've got upwards of about 60 different touch points between themselves and the audience. And there's literally, I mean, there's maps out there as people have created these things, thousands of different places that you can activate. So how do you figure it out? So first of all, you got to figure out how important are these ways of interacting with a customer? And then you have to figure out how satisfied are people with the way you're interacting at these places that may be very important. That's what's typically called a gap analysis. But putting the ball where the other team isn't, you need to use a multiplier, which is how differentiated is it, right? Being really good at something that everybody else is doing, like TV ads, isn't necessarily going to differentiate you. That becomes the numerator to the equation. Then you got to figure out how expensive is all this stuff. Because if it's a great idea and you can't afford it, that doesn't work. If it's a really good idea and it's dirt cheap, holy smokes, let's run that to the front of the list. So the denominator is how much does it cost to invest in this activation. And that's not just what's going out of house to paid media, your agencies. It's all your hours and time and everything internally. Ultimately, this creates this opportunity index. It helps companies mathematically understand when and where they should activate. Now, it's not that simple, right? Because let's say something is really important, doesn't mean you're even doing anything there. So you can't even measure satisfaction, right? 
there's no real way to quantify differentiation. So the point is, it still comes down to this basic thing, which is you need an amazing team. You can't just rely upon data. You have to have insights and strategic and tactical thinking because there's a lot of judgment calls that go into this. And this is what becomes, this is what creates passion brands. If it was as simple as like, let's just throw it into that Google spreadsheet, boop, boop, opportunity index, everyone would do it. You need great strategic thinkers. Wow, Jeff, thank you so much. This was really interesting. Thanks thank for you. joining us today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And we'll see you next time on Sardar TV.